Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's live update. I'm Chancellor Don D. Plowman. Before I get into today's data and other topics related to COVID, I wanna take a moment to recognize the real pain being felt again across this country and by members of our campus community after another police shooting of a black man, Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin. We are in the middle of two pandemics, ongoing racial injustice and coronavirus. Each of them separately exacts an incredible toll. Together, the heaviness and the pain is palpable and the toll is multiplied for members of our community who are black. We want to support members of our campus, staff, students and faculty, and we will continue to update the campus on our progress towards dismantling systemic racism. We are committed to and will continue this important work. For our update today about COVID, we are going to talk with Dr. Paul McInear, Director of Student Counseling Center here at UT. And in a few moments, he'll talk with us about available resources to help members of our campus community, all members of our community. I'm also joined by Provost John Zomchik and Dr. Greg. Thank you to all of you for joining us this morning. Now, before we bring in Dr. McInear, let's review our case counts, which is how we always start in our isolation data and answer some questions about testing and the Student Health Center. So as we pull up the graphic, again, I will reiterate that this information is on our coronavirus website and it's updated every weekday morning. So the numbers you see this morning are the latest count as of last night. And that's always how that data is reported. Today, you see that the total number of active positive cases is continuing to rise. We have 150 active positive COVID-19 cases on campus. 144 of those are students and six are employees. And I remind you that that blue line is employees and we lump together faculty and staff in that line. The green line is students and the, the brown line at the top is the total. So let's look at the next metric that we're always paying attention to as well. As of today, we now have 734 people in quarantine or self-isolation. So that, that's the, look at this tall column at the end. 664 of those in self-isolation are students. Now, mostly our students are isolating off campus and that's what the blue part of that bar shows you. Non-residential students who are in self-isolation. The green bar is one we continue to watch, a green part of that bar we watch really carefully because those are our residential students, students living in the dorms who are now self-isolating. And remember, we have uh, made arrangements for many isolation beds, both for students quarantining and isolating because isolation is for, they've, they're ill, they've been tested positive, quarantining, they're awaiting uh, results because they may be a close contact or other reasons. And what you see there is that green part of the bar is growing. Still, the large majority of even our residential students who are self-isolating have chosen to do that at home. That's an important piece of a metric that we will keep watching because it relates to the number of isolation and quarantine beds that we have. So that green part is 231 students, which are residential. And the, the lower part of that bar is employees who have reported they are self-isolating. Now, since we uh, spoke on Tuesday, we've added a second cluster to the website, originating, as you can see here, in the Zeta Tau Alpha house. That's a sorority. Two people in the house initially tested positive but because of their shared bathrooms and living spaces, the contract tracers have determined the occupants of that entire sorority house are considered close contacts. So everyone's being tested in the house. 
And depending on the re results, we'll either go to isolation because they've been around symptomatic individuals or because they're positive or they have symptoms, or they'll go to quarantine because they're a close contact and they'll wait out their, the incubation date. So again, this cluster is because the county has identified it as um, all because of their living arrangements. They share a kitchen, they share bathrooms. So Dr. Gregg, uh, as you look at these numbers I've put up here, and maybe you could speak to that last issue about the cluster. Is there anything else you would add about the Zeta House or any, any other update you have about that? Yes, thank you, Chancellor. It's good to be with you again this morning. Uh, I would say that, that whenever we're looking at close contacts, essentially anyone who shares a living space with someone else. So we take our individual homes, for instance, if we're sharing a living room, a dining room, and then particularly kitchen area or bathrooms with anyone else, then those household contacts by definition are gonna be considered close contact. And there's just really no way to get around that. If there's a situation where an individual can be uh, isolated within the home, they're not sharing the kitchen, they're not using anyone that, you know, they've got their own dedicated bathroom, then in those situations, then we potentially could avoid having to uh, uh, have individual, other individuals in that home being identified as close contacts. But from the standpoint of our sorority and fraternity houses, we're gonna have a very difficult time not being able to do that. In regard to the graphs that we've looked at, you know, it's still disappointing that we're seeing that number of um, folks that are being identified as close contacts going up. Uh, it, it's just, the key thing is to get in the habit of avoiding being within six feet of other people. And that, that's key. I mean, that, by, by definition, that's what makes you a close contact is being within six feet of someone for more than six minutes. And if they happen to be positive, whether they're symptomatic or not, you are going to be identified as a close contact and you will have to go into quarantine for 14 days. And so if we could just kind of get in our mind that, you know, that distance is so important to us not being identified as a close contact, we could really see these numbers start to plane off. You know, I was out and about on campus uh, several times this week. And first of all, I was thrilled to see almost everyone wearing their masks, students uh, in the library, in the union, outside. Um, so a few people have asked questions about, well, do I have to wear the mask outside? What's that about? Because outside is supposed to be a safer place. What would you say about that, about masks outside versus inside, that kind of thing? Well, the key thing is if you're indoors on campus, University of Tennessee, you need to be wearing a mask. Right. Uh, and uh, when you're outdoors on our campus, we would encourage you to wear a mask, but it's not mandatory as long as you can maintain that six foot of physical distance from other people. Uh, and, and so that's, that's key. The problem is like if you're walking down Ped walkway, you never know when someone's gonna come running up beside you or passing you, uh, might stop you and involve you in conversation. So in those situations, since you don't have a lot of control over that environment, then wearing that mask is probably gonna be important in that situation. But if you've got a hammock set up somewhere, nobody's around you, uh, you've got plenty of distance, then there's no need in that public setting, in that public outdoor setting, for you to have to be wearing that mask. You know, I you just keep drilling about the six feet and I, I was trying to share with students also, they were asking me about, well, what are the rules about partying because they've been hearing me talk about it. I said, we're not saying you can't, we all need to be, we're social animals, we need to be together. But find a way to be together, sit in your backyard, 10 people and just stay six feet away from each other. Sit on a blanket, get your lawn chairs separated. So it, we're not saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we're not saying don't be social, don't be together. We're saying don't cram 40 people into a tiny apartment where everybody's in each other's faces and everyone then is a close contact. Am I right about that, Dr. Craig? That, that's correct. That, that is key. That six feet of distance is what is gonna allow you not to be defined as a close contact. And, that, and that's what's so important to our numbers, especially. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. So let's talk a little bit about testing also. Uh, we've been getting several questions about testing. So I want to go over a little bit this morning, our procedures so far, our plans going forward. So we are testing individuals who have symptoms or they become a close contact of individuals who've been tested. 
So Dr. Greg, talk a little bit about this. There's some confusing information out there, especially this week from the CDC now saying healthcare providers no longer need to, healthcare providers no longer need to test asymptomatic close contacts. Is that correct? Are we changing what we're doing or what, what do you say about that? So it, there was, there are, and there is guidance that comes out almost on a weekly basis that we're trying to keep up with and to make sure that what we're doing here on campus is reflecting at least those recommendations. And sometimes we're even more stringent because we live in a community where so many people are, are, are uh, close together and because so many of our students live on campus or in, in our uh, residence halls or Greek housing, um, it's, it is important for us to be able to quickly identify people that are positive and potentially asymptomatic. So even though the CDC has said that close contacts, that healthcare providers no longer have to uh, test those individuals, we will still be choosing to test individuals that are identified as close contacts because we want to get out ahead of those individuals that may be positive and have no idea that they're infected. So we will continue to test our close positives here on our campus. Okay, uh, it, related to that, we're continuing to get questions, a few of them from students who say, well, how can I go about getting a test? Like, what do I do? So what would you say about that? Can you just walk us through how that works? You know, this is an interesting uh, conundrum that we have. And, and that is that, uh, we really are getting the sense that a lot of students are hesitant to come to the Student Health Center to get tested because they know that they're going to be asked to quarantine or to isolate potentially, uh, or at least to fill out the self-isolation form and someone's going to be getting in touch with them. I want to let students and their family members know that if you're getting tested, we're going to know. Uh, we are an extension, our contact tracers are an extension of the Knox County Health Department here on our campus. And so if you choose to go to UT hospital emergency room or to a walk-in clinic, um, those healthcare facilities are required to report the tests that they are performing and particularly those that come back positive. So ultimately we're gonna know. We've had several students that uh, have been sick for a few days, uh, choose not to come to the student health center, go to some other local facility. And then when their test comes back positive, that information makes its way back to us and it already puts us a day or two behind on trying to keep other people safe. So if there's anything I could really try to get across today is we do quick turnaround time on our test. Yesterday we did 70 tests through the Student Health Center and we have the bulk of those back today already. Uh, and those were done yesterday afternoon. So if, if people want to know what their test results are, they can come to the Student Health Center and get it done you will be asked to complete a self-isolation form, but that's what's necessary in order to keep all of us safe. So I think that's so important what you just said. From the very beginning of the pandemic, anyone, any provider who gives a test for COVID and is positive has to submit that to the County Health Department. And our County Health Department calls Dr. Gregg. So it can just speed everything up for you in terms of knowing your isolation because doctor, our tests come back probably faster than some in the community and it speeds it up for anyone who's a close contact. So I'm glad you really, you mentioned that. Um, is the health center available to off-campus students or is it just for people in the dorms? We actually uh, went through a, a, a lot of um, turmoil and we're able to situate it so that any student uh, that's registered to, or enrolled uh, this semester uh, has access to the student health center. Uh, and so we would just encourage students to, to utilize our facilities for their testing. So if I get tested and I'm waiting to hear, and you just said for us, it's taking like less than 24 hours, but in those 24 hours, what should I do while I'm waiting to hear my test results? Well, the first thing we're gonna ask you to do is complete the self-isolation form. That's what's key to getting this whole, uh, our, our whole health and safety guidelines initiated. So to complete the self-isolation form, a contact tracer will reach out to you once you have completed that self-isolation form. It may be several hours, uh, especially if you're like a close contact and you're asymptomatic and that's what you report on your self-isolation form, you may not be contacted as quickly as someone who reports that they're positive and having symptoms, but they will reach out to you and will give you advice on what needs to be done. Uh, if you live off campus, it's simply gonna be a quarantine or isolate where you are in your own apartment 
uh, or home. Uh, stay away from other folks that are uh, residing there with you until we get some results back and can tell you how to go from there. Okay, so one last thing I wanna say about testing is that we're going to begin surveillance testing very soon. Uh, so in addition to the swab tests that are performed at the Student Health Center, when we do, and, and the surveillance testing, I wanna remind you is we're going to be testing the wastewater in all of the dorms and the, and the Greek houses. What that will do for us is identify, we hope the virus before a student has any symptoms and before they're ever tested so that we can really reduce the potential for that virus to spread because we'll, we'll know what dorm needs further testing and, and we'll be able to figure that out. So when we start that, our case counts will rise because that's gonna show us asymptomatic people that just think they're fine. So let's everybody just put that in the back of their mind. So our numbers today, you saw what they were. Once we get that going, and I think that's more like early September, um, just expect that that will happen. So let me switch gears here and I wanna move towards men, around mental health because this is hard. This is, this is hard for everyone. So we're six months into this pandemic uh, in, a, and in the middle of this national reckoning over racial injustice, that's just so much. And, it, and, and students are starting a new academic year. A lot of our faculty, Dr. McInear, I'm concerned about faculty and staff have not had a break this summer not a single day off. I worry people just running on fumes. And we went straight from this unprecedented disruptive situation in the spring to then planning for fall. Um, it's a lot for everybody, employees and students. And we need to make sure we're taking care of each other. So first I have a question for Dr. Zomchik and then I'm gonna switch to Dr. McInerney. Dr. Zomchik, can you talk about what you're seeing and maybe feeling that is different this semester among our faculty and students. And then I want to turn the rest of this over to Dr. Malkinar for a conversation. Thank you, Chancellor. Yeah, I'll be happy to do that. I mean, certainly what you've been saying just now, we've certainly seen evidence of people who are uh, um, not necessarily struggling, but bearing a burden of trying to keep up with these dual pandemics, as you said. But there really are a number of things that are different this semester, uh, just as there were when we went remote last spring. Um, so I characterize this as we're all more aware of why we're here. We're here to learn, we're here to teach, we're here to serve. And throughout all of this, people are stepping up in these challenging times. I've heard about challenges, I've heard about technology challenges, but I've also heard about those emotional challenges that you've just described. But I also hear, and I'm so glad to hear this, that you know we're drawing down into our reserves to meet those challenges in new ways. Let me give you an example. When we went remote last March, we were really concerned that going remote might hurt student success. From all that we can tell, that didn't happen. One indicator of that is that we anticipate have, having our highest retention rate ever. Now, what retention rate means is that all those first year students who were enrolled with us last year, uh, the percentage of those who come back this fall. So why, why did that rate not fall when things changed so much? To me, it shows that we have a caring community that we are reaching out to one another. When we went remote, we had, a, we had a campaign, call all vols. That's one way that we've changed in order to sort of adapt to all these challenges and this, these new times. We're reaching out to individual students. Next week, we're gonna send out a pulse survey to all of our 24,000 undergraduates. We wanna know how they're doing. We wanna know if they have challenges We'll give them an opportunity to email us and we can reach out to them and help them, whether it's technology, whether it's emotional or mental health, we'll find out and we'll reach out to them individually. Our academic coaches over the last two weeks have held 1,500 individual meetings with our first year students. So all you first year students out there who haven't met with an academic coach, let me encourage you 
to make an appointment. Go to studentsuccess.utk.edu and sign up for an appointment. Your coach can connect you with some of the, all of the great resources that we have here that are here in order to help you succeed. Finally, yesterday I had an opportunity to talk to about 80 faculty members. And this is another way I think that things are different. So one faculty member reported that he scheduled individual check-ins with every single member of all of his classes. They'll be over Zoom, but nonetheless, he is making that extra effort to have a personal relationship, to develop that personal professional relationship to help his students, to let his students know that he cares. Faculty and staff, I can't say enough good about our staff. They are paying close attention to the emotional health and well being of their students during what is a difficult time for so many. I just want to echo your words and encourage, congratulate and encourage the volunteer family to continue to reach out and to support one another in the days, weeks, and months ahead. Thank you, John. So Dr. McInear, from where you sit, you see trends across the country. What's happening as we are both trying, we're trying to you know, deal with both of these big pandemics. What do you see? Well, good morning, Chancellor. I think uh, we, I had some of my colleagues uh, look at some of the national data we put together um, for you this week. You know, as you might expect, the uh, August data from the CDC indicates that anxiety and depressing symptoms have increased significantly across the country. Uh, the prevalence of anxiety symptoms was about three times higher in the second quarter of this year than the same time last year. Uh, depression symptoms about four times higher. But a particular concern for us, I think, is that age group between 18 and 24, we've got about 75% of those students uh, in the surveys endorsed at least one adverse mental or behavioral health symptom in that second quarter of the year. So we're uh, paying attention to, to how this is going to impact the age group that we work with uh, most often. But there are also some signs of hope in the data. I think it's important to, to notice as well. A Google search trends show that anxiety related searches were up about 52% um, during March and April, but then they returned to baseline around May. And so just suggesting that people stopped looking for those things quite as vigorously as they were before. And also interesting uh, study by Lucetti and, and colleagues at the uh, Florida State College of Medicine uh, looked at about 1,500 uh, people across the country around loneliness. And they assessed them for loneliness in January, February, and then again in, in March, and then again in April. And what they found was that on average, participants reported increased feelings of social and emotional support during the pandemic. And that wow. suggested for many people, reaching out to friends and family through phone calls and video chats is actually... Uh, reducing uh, a sense of loneliness and provides a really important buffer as we go through the pandemic. And I think that's a really important thing to notice because it's easy to, to, to take note of the difficulty with social connection and overlook the benefits of what we're doing. I think some people are even reporting they're connecting more with people now because they have to do it intentionally rather than just expecting to bump into them along the way. So, some so that's, that's some good news. Mm -hmm. So what else would you advise for, uh, for our students, for faculty and staff in terms of kind of coping through, through all of this? Well, I think uh, John and Spencer and you have, have all already noticed the, the importance of just trying to support one another. I think that's a big factor in there. I reached out to several of my colleagues this past week to try to gather some uh, what we call the greatest hits of the staff around coping with, with the pandemic. And, and a lot of them uh, pertain to just maintaining social connections and maintaining realistic kinds of expectations of themselves and others and being able to uh, reach out with one another. One of the things I would point out is keeping a healthy perspective is, is especially important. You know, our brains are kind of primed to notice and hold on to negative or threatening experiences. Uh, evolutionary psychologists think this was basically a survival technique. Um, I'm overly simplifying it, but you know, it's more important to recognize where the lions are than where the flowers are. And so we just have a tendency to hold on to negative and, and threatening information. And sometimes, especially during a, a stressful time like this, we have to be more intentional about noticing the positive things that are happening. So things like a gratitude inventory is, is something that we, uh, many of us promote with students and others, where you just take a little bit of time each day, maybe even the evening before going to bed, 
to think through the day and what you can be grateful for, what you can feel genuinely thankful for, and it kind of helps keep some of the negative stuff in perspective. It's also very easy, as you can imagine, to uh, get into doom scrolling. I think it's one of the terms I've heard recently and other kinds of uh, just negative news feeds because our brains seem to just love that stuff and just kind of obsess about it and dwell on it. And again, just intentionally looking for other information that's a little more positive to kind of give us a more balanced perspective. I think an another thing to keep in mind is that our feelings are important, but they're not factual. And a lot of times we can, can buy into some of the feelings that we have and assume that everything is catastrophic because it feels like that, when in fact, it's really not. And what we do know from research is that the way we think about problems really impacts the way we feel about them. And oftentimes we can change how we feel simply by uh, looking at, uh, at problems in a more positive vein, reframing them in a little different way and, and trying to approach them more, um, more positively. But I think the final thing I'd want to mention is just also recognizing uh, how healthy behaviors can really help us cope with a pandemic. I mean, sometimes we call them granny's rules or, 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 or mom's rules, but the basic stuff about eating well and sleeping well and getting some exercise and having a, a regular routine, staying socially connected with other people, and even taking time for reflection or mindfulness, some kind of spiritual exercise, all of those things are clearly connected to uh, uh, buffers against depression and against anxiety and basically keeping us healthy overall. And I think during times of stress, it's easy sometimes to kind of pull inward. I think we're all feeling like under attack and maybe feeling the need to protect. And so it takes even more effort sometimes to reach out and support one another. But in fact, oftentimes if we're feeling down, simply making a phone call to somebody else who might be feeling down and talking about that can be a really important step towards helping both people just feel a little bit better and move on. You know, I love your last point because in my own life, I know that those times where I feel the worst, it's hard to reach out, but I've never been disappointed by doing it. It's always made me feel better, but it's hard to do. Well, sometimes I think we're afraid we're going to burden somebody else or afraid it's going to, they're not going to want to talk to us. But in fact, time and time again, what we find is that when people reach out, uh, most, most of the time, other people are very responsive. So we have a lot of parents on this call, usually every day. Um, they're talking to their students, their children a lot. What resources, can you name two or three resources that exist here that they could sort of nudge their, their daughter or son towards if they, if they learn about them? Of course, I'd be happy to. And I think I want to mention that there are really so many resources, it's almost hard to pick out two or three. Okay. So I want to point people to the, the coronavirus um, resource website that we have available on campus. There's just lots of resources there that people can tap into. But obviously, I want to mention the Counseling Center is certainly a resource for students. And we have a program there called um, Therapy Assistance Online. It's called Tau Connect, and it's a self-help program that's empirically supported. And students and faculty and staff all have availability to that. All you need is a UTK email address, and you can set up an account and begin working through those resources, and they're very, very helpful. I also want to give a shout out to Dr. Uh, David Duper in College of Social Work, who worked with us this summer to help put together a uh, resiliency uh, course that's available on campus. And that's also available to students, faculty, and staff. And just a, a, a lot of resources there that people can tap into. And then uh, there's a brand new community um, COVID-19 helpline that's being sponsored through Helen Ross McNabb. They received a FEMA grant to set this up. And I wanted to highlight that because it's also available to okay. everybody in the community. And of course, as always, 974-HELP, 946-CARE, I want to forget those resources uh, and, and colleagues that work there. Hey, thank you so much. And thank you for being with us today. I hope you'll come back another time because we're going to be at this for a while, it feels uh, like. So thank you. You've made me feel more hopeful. Uh, so I want to just remind everyone who's listening that there are, for additional resources, go to the coronavirus website. That's utk.edu slash coronavirus. And if you click on the guides tab, Underneath that, under coping and support, are a number of uh, uh, links that will help you just to some of the things Dr. McNear talked about. So in closing, I just want to say that thank you again to our guests and to everyone for listening. Keep giving us your questions. It helps formulate the content of these live updates. And I just want to say to everyone, this is hard. There's no getting around it. And it's not something that any of us have ever lived through before. 
I'm confident we will live through it. We've got to make sure that we stay safe. We're going to learn from mistakes that we make as we go. And I'm so grateful to the entire volunteer community for their commitment, their sacrifice, and continuing to give each other hope. And I get, I get hope from it as well. So I want everyone to have a safe and restful weekend. Do something that's fun. I tell people up here on our team, you need a minute to breathe, put down the phone, the, the, the the iPad and enjoy your family and your friends. We will get through this. We need each other. And thank you, Dr. McInear and, and Dr. Zomchik for reiterating that this morning for us. And always thank you, Dr. Gregg, for everything you do. So I hope everyone has a great weekend and let's go balls.